So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning of verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared, for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The subject we're considering this, uh, this morning is wisdom. And the question we're asking one another is, are we wise? Now, don't worry, please. I'm not going to ask how many GCSEs you've got. I'm very proud of my five. I'm not going to ask uh, which university you're applying to or whether the room goes quiet when you start speaking at work or can you do the Times cryptic. You can see in verse 6 that there are two mentions there of wisdom, and again in verse 7. We might equally frame the question, are we spiritual? Because by verse 10 and 11, the, the discussion has moved on from wisdom to what the Spirit says. And then verse 13 through 16, right at the end of our passage, the final little piece it's both wisdom and spiritual together. So the issue is wisdom, who are the wise, and the issue is spiritual maturity, who are the mature, and kind of where are we on the wisdom and maturity scale, and how does a person get to be spiritually wise anyway? Over the last uh, week, since mid-January, I've been reading this letter with uh, something of the eye of a detective trying to build up a photo-fit image of the people to whom Paul's writing. You know, everybody says you can only really begin to understand the application of a letter if you understand what the original intent of the author was. And so you want to look within the letter, not sort of at the archaeology and all the rest of it, but within the letter, what do we know about the people to whom he's writing? And there's no doubt at all, just a first read that Paul's audience considered themselves spiritual, made wise by God, craving wisdom, attracted to those who sounded wise in their ears. Actually, it's fascinating the way Paul describes them, because just if you were here last week, not many of you were wise. Not many of you were powerful. It seems, however on their conversion to Christianity, they then become attracted to you know, spiritually impressive and wise-sounding leaders and some craving knowledge and promoting themselves as knowledgeable, thinking that somehow they've achieved some sort of fast track to spiritual maturity that others hadn't got. 
If you just flick a page there to chapter 4 and verse 8, it's, you can see it there. Already, he says, it's biting sarcasm here. Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are so wise. And then verse 18, some of you are arrogant. So it's going to get very scathing. Who really is the wise one? Who's the knowledgeable one? What constitutes the mature person? One of the most helpful resources in my kind of uh, amateur detective work, which I had to say was very amateur, was this book, which I inherited from my granddad. So he was given it in 1960, but it was written considerably by that, before that, by a guy called Charles Hodge, who was principal of Princeton Theological Seminary. I think he wrote it in his retirement. He has this to say about Corinth. Not only was it the political capital of Greece, it was the seat of its commercial and intellectual life, the place of concourse dealing for the people, not only of the neighboring cities, but of nations, a source from where influences of all kinds emanated in every direction. It was especially important for the spread of the Christian gospel. He then goes on to describe how the Greeks loved wisdom, and we all know how the Greeks loved wisdom, and then he makes this fascinating observation. This letter shows us how the gospel works, and forgive the antiquated language, in heathen lands. I, how does the gospel penetrate non-Christian lands? It shows Christianity in conflict with heathenism. And this is fascinating. We see what method Paul adopted in founding the church in the midst of a refined yet corrupt people. What a brilliant little description of Corinth, refined yet corrupt. And what an important letter for London, a key text of the 20th century West, 21st century West, in a nation no longer by any stretch of the imagination Christian. Well, what does it look like for the, the, the Christian gospel to get, if you like, into the weave of the people who turn to Christ when they've had so many other influences all through their life? Particularly in a city where there are so many churches, so many voices, not to mention preachers and teachers and opinion formers and influencers accessible through the internet. What does it look like? <laughs> And the thing that fascinates me, and I'll just touch on this when we get to the end, is that Paul begins with wisdom. He's going to tackle all sorts of other issues, but actually the, the bedrock, the foundation on all of this is who are you going to listen to? And are you going to listen sensibly? And as I've said, in a world dominated by blogs and podcasts, webinars and YouTube, thought pieces and sermon downloads, what an important letter for us. How are we going to judge which and who is wise? Well, there are two kinds of wisdom, verses 6 through 9. God's wisdom does not come naturally. It's going to be humbling for us, 10 through 13. And then, well, it's kind of, are we wise, are we spiritual, or perhaps even who are you listening to? Two kinds of wisdom, six through nine. Look at verse six, yet among the mature. I love that. I guess there were people puffing themselves up in Corinth saying, you know, the word mature just means complete. Well, we, we're the real deal. You know, we're the mature ones. Among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of the age or of the rulers of the age who are doomed to pass away. It's easy to paint the entire church in Corinth with one brushstroke, as if everything and everybody was the same. I very much doubt that. It does seem, at least some were suggesting, we've taken the next step to maturity. We're the real deal. deal. We're truly spiritual. But says Paul, there are two kinds of wisdom. One is man-made, the other is God-given. Man-made wisdom is of this age. It can only be of this age. The wisdom of the wise man and philosopher, the wisdom of the corridors of power, the wisdom of the person who can quote Shakespeare, recite the value of pi to 375 places, speak seven languages and talk the table of QI. Well, it's only earthly wisdom. I once had a friend who could recite pi to the value of 150 and speak ancient Norse fluently. Dinner was interesting. 
I once spoke on this passage at the Cambridge uh, Christian Union, and you can imagine we had enormous fun. Because, you know, earthly wisdom, it looks so impressive, it sounds so wise, it's reasonable, it makes sense. Because it's only wisdom of this age, it's limited to earthly age alone, and ultimately it will rot. So it's worthless, ultimately. The trouble is it's so impressive. You know, my, I should mention my granddad, and forgive me for this, it's a bit uh, boring when preachers talk about their family, but just for a moment, indulge me. My grandmother was fiercely intelligent. She never went to school. She was incredibly widely read, could quote Shakespeare's sonnets, uh, uh, any number of plays, yeah, she was just in everything. She used to come up to the Ritz once a year regularly to the final of the Times Jumbo crossword competition with 99 other people. Why it happened in the Ritz, I've no idea, but that's where they had it, and there she would do, and she would be in the final of the national, what's it, for the Times cryptic. But you know, there's a way of people like that talk, that talk that, I mean, she didn't do it intentionally, but makes you feel such an idiot. <laughs> And I'm sure you've uh, uh, you know, been in that kind of setting yourself. But all that kind of wisdom, ultimately, it's just of this age. Important that we realize Paul is not rubbishing all academic pursuits. I just glance over at those who are currently sitting their GCSEs. Paul is not rubbishing all academic pursuits. Nor is he saying we shouldn't use our minds in our Christian faith. But he is saying to the Corinthians that their love affair with human wisdom is worthless when it comes to being spiritually wise. Verse 6 again. It's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. And then verse 8, he really drives it home because none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they really were wise, would they have nailed Jesus to the cross? No, they wouldn't if they were spiritually wise. But then there's another kind of wisdom, and you can see it in verse 9, and it's there again in verse 10. So, uh, sorry, in verse 7, and it's there again in verse 9. So verse 7, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages. And I love that, for our glory. It's secret and hidden. It's undiscernible, even to the most acutely intelligent. You can't find it out. You can't work it out. No amount of research in a lab or letters before or after your name or time spent with a professor will give it to you. It comes only from God. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It comes from before the ages. It's his wisdom. And it's divine. And then verse 9, he quotes from Isaiah 64, which comes just before Isaiah 65. And in Isaiah 65, God spells out that he has a new creation for us. Would you in a million years ever work it out in your study that there's a new creation waiting for us? Now that has to be revealed to us. And so no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So there are two kinds of wisdom. And because God is outside our system, so his wisdom and his acts inevitably don't conform to our system. He does things that you just would never imagine. Of course, he's God. But the Greeks and the Corinthians loved wisdom. Some of the new converts craved wisdom, latched themselves onto particular so-called spiritual leaders who conformed to the standards and appearance of wisdom of the age, you see what Paul is trying to do? Just because the guy's got a PhD in theology, he must be speaking the truth. Just because the guy draws a huge crowd on the internet, oh, he must be worth listening to. And Paul says, no, things aren't quite like that. And so you can have all the brains of a nuclear physicist. You can have a triple star first in biochemistry. You can have excelled in university challenge picked up the prize in Mastermind, hit the jackpot in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, walked away with the top prize on Michael McIntyre's The Wheel, which I may say is an absolutely dire show, but we won't go into that, and one countdown, hands down, day after day after day, in afternoon telly. You can have done all of those things, but that wisdom just rots 
ultimately. It comes to nothing. Where then does God's eternal wisdom come from, 10 through 13? Now, these verses could not be more important, and it's essential that we understand who the first person plural is here. Who does Paul mean when he says us and we? These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this. And then right at the end, verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. Who is that we? I don't know if you know this, but we actually plan these services. I mean, you may think, you know, Phil gets in, Henry turn up in the morning, Simpo taps out a few tunes and says, I think I'm going to play that one, and it all kind of comes together on the day. No, we plan the services, and we meet a month before. Can you believe that? And the preacher has to have his outlines for all of the next four talks. That puts the heat on the preacher, I can tell you. But it's very good for us. When we were having our planning for this, there was considerable discussion about who the we are. Is it all Christians? Is it just Paul using the kind of royal we? Who is it? So I've been scratching my head, and you can imagine my joy when there was a great racket next to my study on Friday, and the associates who were in training were next door, and I was going in to tell them to pipe down because people were trying to do some work. And I said, what are you doing in here anyway? And they said, oh, we're studying 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 today. So I thought, well, quid's in. Who are the we in chapter 2? They were of one mind. Oh, not just the apostle, otherwise why? First, but certainly not all Christians. First person, plural, we, the apostolic band. Now, that's where I kind of got to in my thinking. I have to say, I just want to show that I'm keeping up with them, but that is where I got to. If you trace through the rest of the letter, you'll find that again and again and again. Paul talks about us apostles, we. In chapter 9, we, don't we have certain rights as do the other apostles? And so it seems that for Paul, because he as an apostle had had the objective revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ made known to him, and because he was traveling with a group of people who were faithful to that word, he could speak of himself and that little group, Apollos, Stephanus, Timothy, and the others, in a sense of we. We've got the truth because I'm an apostle. God has made known the secret and hidden, hidden wisdom. God has declared the things hidden from before the ages for our glory. God has revealed what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart imagined. Through the Lord Jesus Christ in history, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. God, the Son, he has made him known. God has declared his objective truth, his eternal truth, in and through Jesus, and Jesus has commissioned specifically those who are with him to write that truth down. Now, interestingly, my granddad's book, Hodge, has this to say, unto us, unto these to whom this revelation was made, viz, which is a posh way of saying, i.e., the holy apostles and prophets. Here, the whole connection shows that the apostle is speaking of revelation and inspiration, and therefore we must mean we apostles and not every believer or all the Corinthians. It's hugely important we get this straight. Otherwise, you will actually play into the very problem that was going on in Corinth. You say, oh yeah, well, I'm a spiritual person, I've got the spirit, well, God reveals things direct to me, and therefore I can think, you know, I've got that truth. No, 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 it's not like that. God's revealed it to his apostles. The apostolic band traveling with Paul, they have the truth. Let me read verse 11 and 12. Sorry, 12 and 13. If Paul had a highlighter pen or an italic or a bold on his quill. Now we 
have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words taught not by human wisdom, but by the spirit interpreting spiritual truth to those of you who are spiritual. Now, if you found all that a little bit kind of dense, verse 11, I think, really unpacks it for us. And uh, let's look at verse 11. Who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Okay, here is my little experiment. Forgive me for doing this, but let's have a go at it. Look across the room at the person who is most naturally in your line of sight. Okay, would you please do that? Look across the room at the person who is in the middle block. You may have to look to left or right. Sorry about that. Or you can choose your next door neighbor. What are they thinking? Well, I know exactly what they're thinking. They're thinking, how dare you? This is England. You certainly shouldn't make me look at somebody across the room. Okay, so but, but what were they thinking three minutes ago? What were they thinking? How long is this bloke going to go rabbiting on for? Um... I should have made roast potatoes rather than mashed potatoes. I don't know. You know but what were, you've, you've got absolutely no idea. If we can't know what the person sitting opposite us in their human mind is thinking that is so similar to ours, what in a thousand million years makes you think you can work out what God does? What an extraordinary arrogant assumption. We can't naturally work God out. Natural theology, well, it can take us a little way, but it can't take us into the eternal plans and the divine wisdom of God. What an absurd, and I have to say, arrogant suggestion. No, religion, philosophy is man-made. It can't get you there. Revelation is God-given. That's why we had that passage read. Did we read it to each other from John 16? about how Jesus commissioned the apostles specifically? Do you remember Jesus says in John chapter 3, he who came from above, above is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and what he has heard. Have you actually yourself personally had a face-to-face -face encounter with the living God so that you've seen God in all his fullness? Have you? Now, if you have, we'll get the white guys in the white coats to come and take you away. No, only the Lord Jesus has made God known. And he has entrusted that truth to the apostles. Uh, sometimes I use the image of your goldfish. Let me just ask you about your goldfish for a moment at home. You know, could your goldfish work out what is going on in here from his bowl? No, no, he I just uh, to let you know, no. Does he know about the underground? Or she, may I say, or goldfish, maybe an it, I don't know. But does your goldfish know these things? Of course, just because it lives in this little kind of fishy existence. And anyway, if it did begin to work out the underground, which it couldn't, it would forget it in two seconds anyway, because it's a fish brain. Okay, it just couldn't. It's gone and got the categories. What in a million years makes us think that we can work God out? Or that our earthly wisdom is going to be any good in the matter, if you see what I mean. When I spoke up at Cambridge, the guy there, the president of the Christian Union, very wisely sent me a note beforehand asking what kind of food I like. And he gave me five options of the different kind of restaurants we'd go to. I didn't know the Cambridge Christian Union was quite so well off, but there we are. We had these five restaurants, one of which we picked. But you know, he could have just sat there in his study and thought to myself, well, William looks to me like a vegan. <laughs> That would have been a remarkably stupid thing to do. <laughs> the folly, the stupidity, the arrogance of the I like to think of God as. <laughs> Whatever, ever, in a thousand years makes you think you're qualified. Remember sitting opposite a um, senior guy in Barclays Bank on the board at one of these dinners I have to go to from time to time. <laughs> And they asked me in to say grace. And there, there I was sitting opposite this bloke. And I, I, he asked me, you know, very kindly, he said, well, tell me, well, tell me about yourself. And all the rest of it. I was a young guy at the time. And uh, he said, um, 
and I said, this, and just started to talk to him about the Lord Jesus. He said, well, I, I don't like to think of God like that. And I'm afraid I, I answered him and said, well, whatever do you think makes you qualified to have opinions on that matter? I don't get invited to those kind of dinners very often. <laughs> Here is the university professor of philosophy in Oxford who's written books on the subject. Here is the most powerful man in the world today, President Xi. Here is the religious leader with more followers on Twitter feed uh, than you can imagine. Here is George Soros, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Zuckerberg rather. Here is Cristiano Ronaldo, Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, key influencers. What use is their wisdom? when it comes to knowing the first thing about God. So you stupid Corinthians is what Paul is saying. Why in a million years are you trying to bolster yourself up with man-made wisdom? Get back with the apostles and reveal truth. And so we come to the final point, which we must deal with quickly. Are we wise? Except that doesn't appear to be quite the question. More question appears to be more, are we spiritual? And then when you look at it again, the question seems to be, how, do you, how are you measuring these things, St. Helens? How discerning are we? True wisdom, genuine spirituality originates with the apostles through the revelation in Jesus Christ. If we come to Paul to be taught by him and by the other apostles, then we'll be able to discern things if we're dazzled and beguiled and captivated and titillated by worldly wisdom, we will remain dumb. How will we listen? And verse 15 is fascinating. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. In other words, if you've actually lined up with God's revelation, why, you are now going to be able to be discerning. You'll be able to judge different people speaking and what they're saying. Not that you should be arrogant, but you'll just be able to discern. And that he himself is judged by no one, surely. That, that's what allowed Martin Luther, the Diet of Worms, 1521, on trial before Pope Leo X, to say, here I stand, I'm bound by the scripture, my conscience is captivated to the word of God, may God help me, amen. You know, one man on his own can stand against the world if they're with the apostles' truth. That's not arrogant. It's quite the opposite. It's humble. To whom will we listen? I remember a very senior cleric speaking here a long time ago now, brilliant orator. He actually said virtually nothing of substance. He was very careful to dress up what he said in clothes that made it sound wise to us. It was fascinating how easily we get taken in by that sort of thing. I remember speaking on a platform with one of the funniest preachers, I think probably the funniest preacher I have ever, ever heard. I'm sorry if that's a bit of a disappointment to you, but he was. He was the funniest preacher I've ever come across. What he said was basically a mixture of folklore, social work, and Christian legalism. He worked in a city where everybody went to church twice a Sunday, all the families and everything. And so, inevitably, he had a congregation of 5,000 19 to 25-year-olds. Of course he did. He was the funniest bloke in town. I tell you, I would have gone to that church if I wanted entertainment every Sunday, twice. It was absolutely fan hilarious, but vacuous and damaging. How will you listen? Are you spiritual? Are we discerning? And in an age where you can download and upload and podcast and web in R and YouTube and how are you listening? Final observation. This is where establishing the Christian gospel in a heathen city begins with the battle for our attention, our ears and our eyes, our minds and our thoughts. Any number of key issues are going to be addressed, sex, sexuality, 
pagan practices, behavior in church, what constitutes spiritual practice. At its heart, this is where it begins. Will you come under what appears to be the folly of divine wisdom? And if you will, wow, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, this God has prepared for you who love him. Let's pray together. Our Father, when we look at the religions and philosophies of the world and see how they depict their gods, we see how radically different you are, full of love and compassion and selflessness, kindness, and that you have prepared for us unimaginable blessings in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, would you make us humble enough to sit under what you have taught us, to weigh it as we hear people speak, to weigh things, to be discerning, to be truly spiritual. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.